Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here on the Nebraska Medicine Facebook page. I'm Kayla Thomas, and we're here again with another live discussion about COVID. And today the discussion is specifically going to be focused on testing. So today we've brought in Dr. Steve Henricks, who's a pathologist. Thank you for joining us My today. My pleasure. So just a quick reminder, this is a live chat for informational purposes only. If you have any questions specific to your health or your medical condition, you want to direct those towards your primary care physician. So Dr. Henricks, thank you so much for joining us today. This is a complicated issue and it's one that so many people have questions about and they're just kind of learning to understand. Understand that. So we're going to do a deep dive today into COVID testing. First of all, I think it changes who's able to be tested because of the limitations on testing. So who are the highest priority people to test right now? Yes, well in the initial phase of this operation or this situation, the real emphasis was on the patients who had acute uh, symptoms, meaning the ones who had a fever, who were developing a, a cough progression into pneumonia. They were the primary focus of the testing efforts. Then also it became important to test our healthcare workers, people who were potentially exposed and were developing symptoms that could be COVID, but could also just be allergies. So the second level of effort was focused on them. Now we're beginning to focus on the general population. And I think you'll begin seeing in the next week or so that there will be more broad uh, testing of the general population. How does the virus start? Yes. Well, so everybody has heard that it's like a cold virus. In fact, it is a cold virus. Mm -hmm. There are four others already circulating that are like it, but this one's unique. Uh, so it actually is picked up in the air uh, in uh, an in inhalation of a droplet or uh, picked up something from the, from the uh, counter and then you rubbed your face, your eye, eyes. And that, in, in fact, is one of the ways it gets infected into us. So if you rub your eyes, there is a direct connection between your eye, the tear duct, and the back of your throat. That's how it gets into our bodies. After that, it then replicates in the back of the throat, and that's that scratchy feeling that you sometimes get uh, before a cold starts. And then depending upon your reaction to that uh, infection, it may either stop and be um, ended, or it could spread into your lungs. So there are a couple terms that people throw around, and maybe interchangeably, that they might not understand. People might hear, oh, well, I'm going into the hospital as a patient, or mm -hmm. They're screening for COVID. What's the difference between screening someone and testing someone? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because screening is when the physician or the nurse begins to ask you questions about the disease you could have. So do you have a fever? Did anyone else in your family have a fever? Have you traveled lately? Those are the screening questions that we talk about. Then the next step is collection. And so when people say, I got tested, that isn't necessarily the case. They may have been uh, collected, a sample may have been collected, but the actual test is performed in the laboratory, and then that's when the result becomes available. You mentioned the laboratory, and I think that something, people are used to a lot of things like, oh, they, I was tested for flu or I was tested for strep. These aren't necessarily as complicated of a lab process mm -hmm. as COVID is. Can you explain the process that goes into the a test? A lot of people, sure. A lot of people have seen, for example, a pregnancy test, a little blue line or a little dot that changes color. Uh, that's uh, what is easy to understand in terms of a test. But the test we're talking about here is much more complicated than that. Uh, we have to extract the RNA, the nucleic acid from the virus, uh, from the specimen, and that in itself is a complex uh, operation. And then we proceed to go to the test that actually detects the RNA. So it, it's a very much like a factory, and it looks like a factory. It looks like a big operation with lots of people moving around, lots of instrumentation, and that's why it takes four to five hours to get the actual most sensitive assay that we can uh, provide. Assay is a word people might be hearing if they've kind of listened more technically to mm -hmm. this. What does assay mean? An assay is the word that the laboratory uses for the test. It's the, it's the technical term for a test because it's, it incorporates all the components of the test. It isn't just the one little piece of it. It includes the issue of collecting the sample, processing sample, uh, making sure the extraction occurs, and then the reporting of it. That is all parts of the assay. Um, you talk about the process, and people have heard maybe the phrase test kits, but mm -hmm. it's not like there's one separate little baggie that contains one kit per patient. There's different ingredients and components that go into basically making the chemistry that, that give you the results. Exactly. Reagent right. is another word that's probably new to a lot of our vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So what is a reagent 
and what role does it play in the testing process? Okay, that is a very complex uh, set of issues to uh, resolve. So again, back to the pregnancy test. So if you have an envelope uh, uh, and you open it, uh, that little plastic device is the device, but it's not the reagents. The reagents is when you add the water or you add a color uh, um, detector onto the kit, uh, that's the reagents. And in the case of the COVID test, there's easily 15 different types of reagents. So the extraction itself is a whole group of reagents, one to cause the lysis of the virus or the, the cells, uh, one to purify them away from the, the rest of the material that's in the sample, et cetera. Then there are the, what we call the primers, the probes, the enzymes. Those are all reagents. It's very much like making a pie. There's, a, there's 15 different types of things that go into the pie. Those are all reagents. And if you're missing one really important ingredient, That's then right. If you leave out the sugar in the pie, you've got a big problem. If you leave out one reagent in the process of this test, it will not work. Um, the sample itself is also incredibly important. And um, I think that's, that's exactly right. It's bec and that is the explanation for why we see and have heard so much about the asymptomatic patient or mm -hmm. the asymptomatic spreader. What we know now is that uh, at, when we went back to look at those individuals who were originally called asymptomatic spreaders, it turned out they either actually did have some symptom or the test itself was not properly applied. The specimen was not uh, uh, properly collected. So collecting the right specimen is very important. And what is that process like for someone if they're getting tested for the first time or someone who has been testing? Can you describe what it feels like? Yes, absolutely. So um, uh, many people obviously have had something maybe small put in their nose, uh, but a swab is a, uh, a device on a stick. Uh, some people could uh, equate that to a swizzle stick. And the swizzle stick has a little a bit of cotton, so very much like a Q-tip, but it's a smaller Q-tip. And then that is pa passed through the bottom of the nose, the floor of the nose, all the way to the back of your throat. And I think a lot of people are surprised just how far back into your head your throat is. Uh, it's, it's at least four inches. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it takes a bit of a time and a long stick to get to the back of the throat to get the sample. Yeah, show me with your fingers how long that stick is. Yeah, so it would be about this long. And, and then that would be sent into the back. And so um, it's really the back of the nose. It's where your air is, is um, humidified. It's not the back of the throat. So it's not the back of the mouth. It's the back of the nose. And the quality of what winds up on that swab determines basically the quality of the results of the Correct. test. Correct. For example, there's lots of talk about just swabbing the outside of the nose or just the inside of the nose. Unless there's a lot of secretions, that is not going to be an adequate specimen. We're really looking for the cells where the virus is replicating, and that's in the very back of your nose. Just a reminder to those of you who are posting comments live, I am monitoring those as they come in. Um, I'm not surprised that we got a question about quick tests. Because okay. that's something that we have heard a lot about. What's the status of seeing quick tests in Nebraska? And then how reliable are they compared to what we're doing now? Those are uh, both excellent questions because as you point out, uh, it seems like every night some other company has announced a new test or, and this one is 45 minutes and, and this one's better because it's five minutes, et cetera. And then you've just heard me talk about one that is four to five hours. So obviously that can't be the best test. But in fact, it is the best test. Uh, we validated it in, our, uh, in the people who were here from the cruise ships. And so we absolutely know that it is the most sensitive and accurate test that's out there. So we are comparing it against then these new assays that are arriving. And they are actually here. We're looking at them right now. There's one we're looking at that is a 15 minute test. And what we've learned so far is about, it's about 70% correct meaning if the individual has a large amount of virus, it's going to be uh, able to detect it. If the individual is recovering or has a small amount of virus, it will be a f what we call a false negative. So right now, if we're looking at the test that takes a longer time period, that five to six hours, as opposed to that 15 minutes, it has a much higher accuracy rate. A absolutely much higher. But again, the question is, is there a place in the healthcare system for the very rapid test? If it is the question of, where do we want to place this individual? Sure. Do they need to go into isolation or not? 
maybe that's where we're going to be able to apply this very rapid test. So using the technology in both ways, basically, yeah. there's, there's a place for both of them. Exactly right. So if we're going, when we are moving into this next phase of the outbreak and we want to look at prevalence, meaning are there still people out there who have low uh, levels of virus, then you need the absolutely most sensitive test you have. But if we're looking for people and trying to decide, does this person need to go into an intensive care unit, that's maybe where the lower sensitive test could be used. Sure. Um, you mentioned something that I want to ask about. Um, the Diamond Princess cruise ship members, mm -hmm. people know that, that here uh, at Nebraska Medicine, we were one of the f basically first places in the country that saw people who were positive for COVID-19. What did we learn from that and how is it kind of helping us as we move through the pandemic? Well, first of all, it was a heroic effort and that's what the entire operation was designed to do, to buy time for the country. Uh, to be able to take care of the so-called first wave of the problem. And that's what, was, uh, that's what happened here and that's what we uh, have encountered. Uh, but we did learn a lot from it. We got to then characterize how quickly or how long it took for people to recover. And I'm sure many of you people know that, that a, a number of the individuals were interviewed multiple times over a two to three week period of time before they absolutely recovered. But at the same time, we were able to in, uh, investigate those people and ask just how much virus did they still have? And so all of that information is what we call the clinical history that c taught us a great deal about how this disease occurs and how it happens and how it continues. Um, a question that just came in from David. Where are we at when it comes to testing capacity? Is the reagent still the big issue or what will it take at this point to be able to test more broadly? Mm -hmm. I know that's a very complicated it question. Is. Sure, and back to the point of the reagents as I pointed out earlier. So if it was just one reagent or one little box, it would be easy. But because there's this component of extracting the RNA and then analyzing the RNA, it turned out that there are all kinds of challenges to provide supplies for all those steps. So have they all been addressed? No, but I'd say we are really making good progress now. Every time we um, made some progress, another challenge came up. So for example, after we dealt with the problem of the extraction, then we didn't have enough swabs. Um, but what's so amazing is the ingenuity of people. And so uh, it, it's a fun thing for you all to look into, and that's the printing of swabs. So there is actually an instrument that actually can print just like the printing of a device, they can print a swab on a computer and on a table uh, utilizing the, uh, the special technology. So now we have a, an abundant supply of printed swabs, something that never even existed before this outbreak. The innovation that we have seen come out of this, the way that the community is working together and some industries outside medicine, the way that they've been able to step up has been incredible. And innovation, of course, is something we value here deeply at Nebraska Medicine. So our thanks to everyone who's been involved in that. Um, where is testing actually taking place? Okay, so uh, the testing is performed now I inside the hospital. There's a hospital laboratory. There's a testing facility in the public health laboratory. And there's a testing facility at CHI. And all of them have uh, high throughput, uh, high capacity tests that are in operation today. Um, what else would you want to add to people out there who, a lot of times we just see over and over again, we need to test more people, testing needs to happen, the United States is behind because of testing. How do you address kind of those issues overall from a science perspective? Mm -hmm. Like it's frustrating for people that more people can't be tested? Well, I, I, I get it when people make that the topic of the day, um, but testing itself is not a competition. There's nothing therapeutic about the test. Um, it does inform uh, policy, et cetera, but there's nothing that's going to cure somebody because they've had a test. So th that's hard to take. Um, but I liked what you said earlier about this whole issue, and it's very much like it feels like we're on Apollo 13 and we're flying back from the moon, and something happens every moment of the way, and we get a new challenge, and then the people react to it, and we uh, group and come up with a common solution. I think that's what the situation that we're in. And I think we're going to land just fine when this is all over. And then we're going to have a very big celebration. <laughs> I cannot wait for that celebration. This is a question that was asked. Um, we do have an employee forum for our employees uh, every week. And we get to ask our own questions of our experts here as employees. One of the reasons why we want to do this to give all of you in the general public access to these great minds as well. But some people have thought maybe they had COVID or they had something that sounds like it mm -hmm. back in like October or November. Mm -hmm. Is that possible? Okay, and be, when you said like it, it's absolutely possible because the 
the coronaviruses, there's four other ones already circulating, and any of those could have caused symptoms very similar to this current um, COVID-19. So in fact, yes, you could have had a pain in the back of your throat, you could have had a low fever, but it very likely and almost certainly wasn't COVID-19 because we were able to watch it very carefully and watch it arise uh, in Wuhan province, et cetera, and then come to here. So um, yes, it could have been a coronavirus, but it was not COVID-19. Um, moving forward, when testing is more broadly available, there will also be kind of another class of testing to kind of figure out about more things about immunity. Basically, let's just take one step forward and, and what's next as far as mm -hmm. what pathologists can learn, what scientists can learn once we get through this initial wave of responding to the pandemic itself? So I think what is next, and the public health officials are working on this right now, and that is now to determine the prevalence of the virus in the population, meaning who's still infected, who's still able to spread it, um, how many people are at, still at risk. And that's the, the phase of the operation that we're about to enter. And what we will learn from that then is, will our population have COVID-19 in it forever or for a long period of time, just like the other coronaviruses yeah. are in our population? We don't know exactly when those other coronaviruses appeared in the history of humans, but they very likely appeared in the same way this one is and then they spread throughout the population. And interestingly enough, they will likely spread into the southern hemisphere because as it cools off uh, and we warm up, it will then be in that hemisphere of the world. So it's very likely that this will continue uh, for a long period of time. But the science is continuing, the innovations are continuing. Um, kind of with that in mind, this is hard for a lot of us right now, hard of us who have children at home who mm -hmm. aren't able to see our relatives. Um, what advice do you have people when it comes to just listening to the science, scientists and listening to public health experts on this? Well, actually, um, the, the advice I would have and the one I give to my family is make sure you are um, um, doing other things uh, as well. So it's great to be informed, but make sure you get a sampling of information. You don't just use one source of information because, in fact, that may or may not be the, the truth. It may not, may not be fully informed. As I pointed out earlier, there was a lot of information or a lot of belief about these asymptomatic carriers. Well, that's true for that period of time. But if you weren't then listening to the next layer of news or the next layer of information, you would not have learned that, that the asymptomatic carriers are quite unusual and rare. So broadly sample, but also make sure you live the rest of your life and you don't just watch the media focused on COVID-19. There's a lot of other things out there to be learning about and listening to. And when it comes to sources, of course, the CDC always has good information. On our website, we have the nebraskamed.com slash COVID site. Those of us who work on the communication side of things are working with our pathologists, are working with our infectious disease experts, are working with our critical care doctors, because as we're learning more and more every day, we're trying to get that information to you. So if you do have a question that you've posted and we haven't answered it, we'll do our best to go in and type in answers for those later. So thanks to all of you in watching and any closing thoughts for you? Well, I think you brought up the good point at the end, and that is that just as we need a balanced diet for nutrition, we need a balanced diet of information. And so it is good to keep listening and learning, but don't overdo and, and stay focused on what is good for your own personal health. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Hendricks. We really appreciate your time. Thanks to all of you for watching. As this information changes, we're gonna to continue to broadcast live here. And we thank you for your time and hope you have a good afternoon.